This episode is brought to you by Tech in Asia. Become a subscriber to gain unlimited access to exclusive, high quality, and in depth reporting on the Asian tech and startup scene for as little as 55 cents a day. That's less than the cost of my train ride this morning. Visit techinasia.com slash subscription to learn more. Hello and welcome to Startup Snapshot, a Tech in Asia podcast. This season, we're talking to the leaders among innovators in the Asian startup scene about their founder journeys, their highest and lowest moments, and how they've overcome the challenges they've faced along the way. My name's Nat, and with me on today's episode is Kelvin Teo, co-founder of peer-to-peer lending platform, Funding Societies. Welcome to the podcast, Kelvin. Hi. God, hey. Glad to be here. So this is my first time meeting you. I didn't <laughs> actually get to meet you before this. Yes. Uh, but it's so good to meet you in person. Um, maybe can you tell me a little bit about what Funding Societies is and how it works? Sure. Um, so Funding Societies is a... It started off as a peer-to-peer lending platform and gradually evolved into a SME digital financing platform. We basically give loans to small, medium businesses um, as a form of alternative financing for for SMEs. And these loans are typically crowdfunded by individuals and or institutions as a form of alternative investments. Um, we were launched in June 2015. Uh, ever since then, we have uh, expanded um, across the region. So currently, we are licensed and operating in three countries, Singapore, Indonesia, as well as Malaysia. Okay. Um, and in Indonesia, we are called Modalku. So you guys started in 2015. Um, it was you and your co-founder, Reynold Wijaya. That's right. right. Um, what, where did the idea for funding societies come from? So I first got to hear about the idea even before I went to uh, went to do my master's at Harvard. Um, at that time, a friend from EDB told me about the idea that I researched. Um, and, and my response was, hey, this is insane. Who will give money online and who will borrow money online? I think after reach, uh, when, I was, when I was at US um, doing my master's at Harvard Business School together with Raynaud, who was my, my first, first few friends and also uh, my classmates there, um, we found that this idea was actually taking off very well in the US and we took the opportunity to visit all the, the major peer-to-peer lenders there and we found that, hey, this potentially could work in Southeast Asia uh, based on our previous experience um, uh, working with SMEs or in Reynolds' case, um, he was previously, his family business was an SME before becoming an MNC. So um, so we took it upon ourselves to bring it back to Southeast Asia. Okay, and you realized that this was something that was popular or at least thriving in the West. Yes. Um, and you guys decided what was the scene here for P2P lending really non-existent? At that time, I was really early. Um, okay. So the first peer-to-peer lender uh, in Southeast Asia started in Singapore in 2013. Mm. Um, and at that time, we were we just started school, so it was around for our master, so it was around 2014, 2015. So it's really new in Southeast Asia. Okay, a year later, right? You guys expanded uh, to start Modalku in Indonesia. Correct. I know that Reynold, he's he primarily stays in. Jakarta, where uh, Modalku is based. Right. Uh, and you spend most of your time here in Singapore. Right. Uh, as co-founders, is it is there a lot of problems with having co-founders not in the same country? I think it is... I think it's quality time, not quantity time per se. Um, okay. So I do fly down to to KR in Jakarta at least once a month. Um, and so so there's there time spent and usually when I fly down, I always stay at his place uh, regardless of whether he likes it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but usually, usually I have a really good time there and um, and I'm oftentimes known as the as the, the second wife um, to, to, his, to his first wife. Um, <laughs> though sometimes I think I'm the first wife. <laughs> but I think on a, more, on a more serious note, I think, um, no, actually I can be husband as well. Anyway, on a more serious <laughs> note, um, so we, we took a very... Um, we, we actually made sure that we spent, even before we started a company, we spent a lot of time having the hard conversations uh, done up front. So mm-hmm. I think just referring to the books, uh, The Founder's Dilemma, The Hard Thing of Hard Things, um, we, we were reading like one book a week to make sure that we came up to, to learn about how to run a business when we started a company, right? And there were a lot of, di- we realized that there were a lot of lo- decisions that seem lo- logical now may turn out to be actually painful in the future, right? So we actually make sure that we trash out those uh, conversation, hard conversations up front. Right. Um, because what, I've, what we find is that a lot of founders like, because when you start a company, it's exciting, you go through a honeymoon period, you think that everything is fine and you avoid the hard questions, questions right? I think we took pains to actually have the hard questions up front and we see that, hey, we still like each other and we still want to do this after that conversation. Right. So, so that built a lot of trust and 
uh, and clarity. And also importantly so was that fundamentally we share similar core values um, and, and vision, right? And that helps in terms of aligning our overall conversation. Um, so so well, after we start a company, we whenever we, we spend a lot of time communicating even off uh, on uh, online um, and whatnot so so that actually helps to build um, at least based on some of the team members feedback one of the strongest uh, founders relationship that we have seen among startups All right and you guys were good friends before starting because you guys were in school together uh, you mentioned he was one of the first friends that you found right um, fortunately or unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> well for now it looks like fortunately yeah. uh, but like why what was it that actually drew you guys to each other as uh, well initially schoolmates and then becoming friends while you guys were in Harvard? I think it's a lot of it is actually driven by Reynaud because we we are very we are very opposite slash complementary personalities, right? And mm-hmm. you having met Reynaud, you know that it's kind of it's a, a bit of a bubbly, outspoken, extroverted person. Uh, whereas I'm not I, I'm kind of passive when it comes to uh, comes to socializing and whatnot, right? So so I think it took a very it was it, he actually took um, very proactive steps to actually build a community uh, we did, we, uh, or Southeast Asian community within Harvard um, and that after that we found that um, it was actually during a pretty uh, uh, a, a drinking session in New York that uh, we realized that uh, hey we have similar values and, and, and passion that's why uh, that, that's why we got together to do things right in fact one of the things that I vividly remember was basically we were just drinking in a hotel room um, and that and I, I basically had an entering hypothesis that hey most folks from family business are kind of um, usually have a, always a sense of entitlement right that hey I'm rich uh, let me chill out uh, right. and whatnot right and but I one one quick, quick observation was that this guy was uh, was is different uh, is different right that um, because he was part of family business therefore there's a chip on his, on his shoulders that hey I want to uh, I want to prove that I'm successful not because of my family business mm-hmm. and I thought that was actually a really good uh, very um, a powerful spirit, um, and and that's why we, we started having more serious conversation. But when we, when I chanced upon this idea, I pitched it to Renault, um, and conversations got uh, progressed, got serious, and and we started a company. Right, and I guess this friendship that you guys had um, really helped when you guys uh, really kicked off with funding societies, and you guys faced several difficulties. I right. mean, like starting a company in itself is not easy. Right. Uh, starting a company. Uh, in another country while studying in a different time zone right. uh, is incredibly more difficult. Right. Um, and you guys did also face a few challenges along the way. Right. Um, what were some of these challenges that you faced in the early days? So I think starting a company while studying in a different time zone, um, the, basically the, the, the key sacrifice is that you just don't sleep long. So, <laughs> so And that you miss the parties, that uh, the costume parties that uh, that your, your classmates are, are, are going. And uh, the truth is that we didn't do very well in school. Okay. <laughs> we, we graduated, but we were not, not the best of students. Right. Um, so I think for me, it wasn't too, in all candor, it wasn't too hard a transition because previously at McKinsey or KKR, we were quite hard in the first place, right? So so working long hours at uh, is, is okay. Uh, Ray not really have grown, t- uh, come a long way um, because last time he, we used to work say, say 8 p.m. to 3, 4 a.m., right? So that it is 8 a.m. here to 3, 4 p.m., right? right. So 12 hours time difference. Um, and he would kind of he, he would kind of be half dead by the by the 12 a.m. mark or oh. 1 a.m. mark, right? So, <laughs> But now he's re- he's, he's that he has really built other stamina and, and and tolerance, right? So so that initially was quite was 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 quite tough. But I think what happened, um, <laughs> quite a public fa- a public crisis we had was that um, the week when we graduated, mm-hmm. um, actually one week after we graduated, so we were going for our graduation trips and whatnot, and we received a uh, notification, uh, uh, a public announcement that MES is going to regulate uh, peer-to-peer lending with immediate effect, which right. also means that anyone without license needs to stop operations with immediate effect. Right. So no. Uh, so at that time, we, was, we were still in the process of uh, fundraising for our Series A. We have received a term sheet from Sequoia Capital mm-hmm. who, um, who has got conducting due diligence um, and that... and. And that basically the new regulations will wipe out ninety percent of our business um, at that time wow. because ni- Singapore accounted for ninety percent, um, and we have basically two months runway of our bank account. So basically, we face a situation whereby a um, there is no clarity on how we're going to get a license because that no no license in that category has ever issued out. This is going to be the first ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, b um, in the interim, how do we continue business operations where the team actually uh, feel demoralized and leave and c Will will Sequoia actually pull back their pull back their term sheet right. um, 
which rightfully they have, they have all rights to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, given that our business is is one tenth of the size now, yeah. um, and with but no clarity of it. Previous to this, um, this, this these licenses being um, uh, announced, were there no licenses that you guys could get in Singapore? There, there was no, there was actually none at that point in time. Right. Um, it w- the the I think the regulators moved quickly, partly because there was a huge blow up at China a few months before that. Mm-hmm. Um, so so that's why the that's why and and in all Canada, thanks to the the Chinese blow up, um, that's why a lot of regulators in Southeast Asia took a more proactive approach in terms of regulations, and that allowed uh, the peer to peer lending space to to grow more sustainably in Southeast Asia. Right. What actually happened in China that led to this blow up? So basically, I think peer-to-peer lending started in China around 2016, 2017, right? Mm-hmm. And that um, there was basically a gold rush whereby, by, whereby th- thousands and thousands of platforms were set up because it was not regulated. And I think that re- because regulators took a back seat and see hey, how this goes before, before they actually uh, figure out how to regulate, um, it ends up having a lot of platforms were actually poorly run, sometimes, act- oftentimes irresponsibly run, whereby the money of investors are actually... T- used uh, for person is being misappropriated uh, frauds were happening so and so forth right so that's why um, one of the big blow up was the whole Yitzupao case whereby billions of dollars of investors money were, were siphoned away wow. especially when Yitzupao was one of the biggest platforms in China and China is huge right mm-hmm. so so that actually got got uh, regulators attention um, though I think on the flip side everyone likes to di- like to diss China about uh, this blow up but I think that we are really standing on the shoulders of giants right if not mm-hmm. because of those that blow up um, Southeast Asia may actually experience the same situation right so so the, the quick implementation of regulations actually caught us at a very bad time mm-hmm. so when I, just now I was talking about how starting a startup in a regulated business is extra hard because any regulatory change at the wrong timing can really hurt you significantly right so so we almost we almost collapsed um, um, during that period of time, so I could, I would, I would, uh, Reno and I had a very good chance of becoming the first, uh, first HBS graduates that have lost their job within the first week of graduation. <laughs> oh. um, so making records already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Breaking tra- as trailblazers. Um, so we're very fortunate that um, after quickly brainstorming, we be- we figure a path to actually restructure the business, um, and that was possible under three conditions, i.e., finding investors. Who uh, debt investors who who have faith in us continue to have faith in us, um, making sure that team members continue to have faith in us, and finally Sequoia not pulling back the the, the equity uh, their their their, fund, their their Series A offer right? right. So we were very fortunate that all stars aligned in a pretty uh, all stars aligned at that period of time. That's why we leave to fight another day. Right. Um, but but how was how was your staff members' reaction actually? Because at this time they actually hadn't had that much face time with right. you and Reynold, and then you guys came back. And suddenly, there's this whole thing where you lose ninety percent of your business. <laughs> what was the reaction in the office? Um, they actually they look pretty cool about it. Um, <laughs> actually, taking a step back, no, there are there were two school, two ca- two groups, right? One of my senior hires, um, after hearing it from the mouth of MAS, um, he was his his name is Vikas, and his face turned green. Oh my <laughs> so, god! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so so it was clearly disturbing uh, for for some folks, right? Where whilst others folks maybe they, they they have a very good poker face and they, they seem to be chill about it. So um, on high side, I still don't know why they stuck around. You know, okay. <laughs> uh, but we were very fortunate and grateful for the team that have uh, have have lived through uh, uh, thick and thin with us during that mm-hmm. difficult period of time. Did, did you do anything to kind of reassure them or to kind of you know rally them to work against the odds? We we actually base we took. We took the whole World War Two pre- World War Two prisoner of wars approach, right? That hey, we basically kind of this is the plan. That, this is the situation. This is how we're gonna solve it, um, and then we leave a day at a time to to actually crack it, right? Piece by piece, piece by piece, right? right. Um, instead of saying that hey, how uh, thinking too far ahead, saying that hey, these are the ten thousand things we need to solve. Let's solve the first piece one by one. Um, so we were fairly transparent in ter- in, in in communicating this, um, and and I think. Uh, Perhaps it was the conduct that uh, how how Reno and I have held, our, held, held ourselves uh, or conducted ourselves that we were able to to garner the trust and faith of the team that hey maybe these two HBS kids know a bit uh, a thing or two to figure this out or we'll we'll survive. So so really fortunate that um, things work out at the end of the day. Right, and then on the investor front, um, how did you get uh, Sequoia to actually still have some faith in the two of you? Um, basically, we took the same approach, right? That hey, these are the challenges based on our, based on our legal advice. We basically we basically um, 
went all in with our legal advice for the remaining two months of runway, right? <laughs> they, uh, based on the, one of the most uh, established law firms in, in Singapore, this is what they've, they've recommended that we can, we can do, which is legal. Um, mm-hmm. and we ran it through with MES um, and we and we we presented basically a proposal that this is how we're going to solve it, right? Um, the truth is that there's no ex- no clarity in terms of when t- regulations, were, uh, when a license will be awarded or whether it will be awarded to us, right? Right. Um, I think that, so after after the whole episode when we ask uh, Sequoia for feedback in terms of, hey, hey why do you all invest in us? Um, I think the, the answer that I gave was that, hey, um, you all were very aggressive in terms of... Um, of growth and expansion, but very conservative in terms of risk management as well, comp- uh, as well as compliance, and mm-hmm. and that makes it very rare. Um, so so really grateful that they were betting on us as a person, um, as opposed to necessarily because the business was doing that well. All right. So they didn't just look at the numbers; they really looked at you and Reynold as people. And, yes. And and your mindset and the values that you hold. Right. Right. Okay. So when how long did it take actually for you guys to get the CMS license? So we fortunately we actually took took it at got it at record time kudos to MES right so uh, everyone before the whole application everyone was telling me that hey uh, best case scenario 6 months worst case scenario 12 months oh, right wow. and for for because this has never there's no such license have ever been awarded before right um, so so really kudos to MES that we actually received our in principle approval within 3 and a half months uh, mm-hmm. 4 months and that was basically the fastest ever um, in, in the history uh, of MES and that um, we were f- as for a new category of license right. uh, and we were among the first if not the first to have received it right so so we've been very very lucky right and and when you got the license um, within that time was your runway still at the two months there was or did Sequoia kind of come in Sequoia has injected capital into right. that so everything kind of came together all the stars aligned and everything was timed just right that you guys made it out alive. Yeah, so so it was a it, it, it was a very close call. Right. Okay. And now now you guys uh, that was about three years ago. Um, three years later in 2019, how does funding societies today compare to the early days back then? <laughs> uh, we we look at our first version of our website. It's like, dude, how did we come out of this? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> but I think we have. Uh, we have been very fortunate that uh, we have grown from one of the many players. In fact, we were known as the late comer, fast mover, right? So, so being late for a first move for for a business that has first mover advantage is kind of bad. Um, so we have moved from that to to becoming decisively the biggest uh, platform in in our, in SME digital financing in Southeast Asia, right? In fact, by we are by. By the by, by most metrics, we are about four, at least four times the size of the number two competitor in the region. Oh, okay. So and we have built up a lot more capabilities um, that beyond what we have previously envisioned mm-hmm. uh, from a technology, from a business, and for, from an organizational uh, perspective, right? So, so I've been really fortunate for for the right um, in the, in the last three four years. Right, and and since that Series A round by uh, Sequoia in twenty sixteen, um, you guys ran a Series B round of funding. Um, last year, 2018, yes. right? And it was a $25 million Series B round led by SoftBank, right. the biggest funding round closed by a P2P lender in Southeast Asia at the time. Um, it still is, like, by the way. Oh, it, it still is? Okay. Because uh, I think other our peers like to announce their their fundraising to include both debt and equity components. So ah. we are still the biggest. Okay, okay. so, so how, how, how did it get to that level where you guys raised this incredible amount of money? Uh, from SoftBank that until now holds the record as the largest uh, funding round for a P2P lender in Southeast Asia? I think we have, I think it's both showing a, 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 a vision of how we can be a lot bigger than what we are right now and showing a track record that we can deliver on what we promise, right? Um, mm-hmm. So we were very fortunate um, to be introduced uh, by, by SoftBank um, Pretty pretty early, in, pretty, even before we start, we were planning to even start fundraising, right? And we actually been very fortunate that SoftBank take like Sequoia SoftBank takes a very supportive approach in terms of whole fundraising. So what what you see in a lot of a lot of VCs is that hey, you are fundraising for me, therefore try to convince me, right? But I think that I think both Sequoia and SoftBank, maybe other VCs as well, but we don't know is that they take a bit of a devil's advocate approach, such that someone within the firm is actually advocating for you and help you to think through how do you put together a pitch deck, what are the information, help to clarify your, your train of thoughts, right? And I think that's really helpful for for early founders like ourselves, right? Um, and and that because 
um, before we start a company, we have strategically thought through what are the what are the pl- what is the vision and what is the path to be number one and how do we execute against that. I think that we have enough proof cases to show that this is going to be big and we are going to be the best team to drive it. Right. So so one thing led to the other. Before we know it. Um, s- so we were telling SoftBank, hey, we're going to fundraise, start officially fundraising in January. Uh, we met them in June. Um, so they they were also very shrewd that they started asking more questions and more questions. And <laughs> because they know that we're going to fundraise in, in, in January, they basically invited us for an IC meet, investment committee meeting in November. And before Christmas, they gave us an offer. Okay. And and kudos to them also that um, some funds may actually try to lowball you because they try to time time you before your whole fundraising race, right? Mm-hmm. So that, hey, there's the only option on the table. We can, they, have a, they have high bargaining power and try to squeeze you for that, right? I think kudos to, um, to, to SoftBank. They actually gave a pretty competitive offer, so, um, which I think reflects uh, h- how honorable they are as a, as a team. Um, so, so that's why we, we, we were very fortunate that we were able to raise our Series B even before we started our Series B fundraising. So with this evolving fintech space, um, what are some of funding societies and Modalku's plans to develop towards the future? I think that Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia are very. Uh, 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 we are still scratching the surface in all these three markets, right? Um, I think moving forward, a large part of it is really just deepening in terms of all these markets, both in terms of products as well as channels and partnerships. But also on top of that, from a uh, from a from a geographic perspective, we are actively. Um, we actually have been seeding uh, new markets for the last 12 to 18 months and, and we are just timing to see when is a good time to launch in a new market. Okay. Um, because at the end of the day, we are called funding societies with a plural uh, pl- plural noun. It's because we are hoping to impact Southeast Asia, at least the six key economies, not just our current own home countries. right? So we are so from a geographical expansion perspective, not just where are we looking at domestic markets, but also looking at the next uh, fourth or fifth market, uh, right. as we speak. And, and also doubling down in terms of tech and data science Right, mm-hmm. um, which we have. Uh, I think that when we first started off in 2015, 2016, we have not that much data to actually um, have to to actually leverage on on real machine learning work to to improve productivity as well as credit underwriting. Right, but now that in the last four years we've accumulated a, a wealth of data that we can actually do r- some very very meaningful and impactful data analytics and data science work. So that's something that we're actually doubling down or actually have been doubling down in the last six, nine months or so. Okay, well, so sounds like a pretty exciting road ahead for funding societies and Modelku. Um, so opening far. new markets and like improving on the core product and everything. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, actually, before we wrap this up, we have some questions from listeners. Sure. Because about, uh, well, yesterday, but by the time people are listening, it's about a month ago. <laughs> Um, we posted on Instagram story right. uh, some questions for our lis- uh, from our listeners who want to know more about funding societies. So let's just go through some of these. Mm-hmm. Um, first question from Sam Ball Hustler. <laughs> Does funding societies fund ideas similar to incubators? Sure. So I think it's a common, common uh, pers- uh, misconception. I think for so a lot of a lot of the, I think the general general public oftentimes think of of peer to peer lenders as funding startups. Um, the truth is that I think we oftentimes for for uh, find younger companies, but younger companies with a steady cash flow um, to make to make the monthly loan repayment right. Um, because at the end of the day, we uh, while we are here to really enable. Uh, Offer an alternative form of financing to SMEs. We have to be responsible to the inv- to the investors as well, and therefore we need to make sure that the loans that we are giving out are, are, are we are giving out to creditworthy companies, right? And oftentimes, given that startups require or players and incubators require to have a pretty long build up period before they have a sustainable or, or predictable cash flow, um, that's why oftentimes we we work less with startups, but actually more with. Um, more stable SMEs. Um, of course, there are also oftentimes exceptions because some startups can actually become cash flow positive very quickly, or at least have a steady co- uh, source of cash flow. Right. Um, and therefore, we actually try to complement them uh, as, uh, in terms of providing them debt financing to rank- lengthen their runway. Um, but I think that a large part of our customer pool are actually, estab- uh, actually SMEs with a pretty established cash flow uh, pattern. 
Okay, so it's slightly different, I guess. Um, yep. But same, same, but different. But we can kind of see where certain ball hustler is coming from right. from the name funding societies. Right. Okay, so next question. Um, we have quite a few questions. Um, with like related to the operations. So right. From Rose and C, have they been able to recover defaulted loans? So so far, so far we actually have been. So I think for context, we have lost about. So we have given out about seven hundred and fifty million Singapore dollars in loans since twenty fifteen. Currently, doing around sixty five million every month. Mm-hmm. Um, cumulatively, we have lost about. We have a we have a default loss of about eight million Singapore dollars. So so we have default losses, even though and as a percentage of default, we are probably we are around one two percent, but we have default losses. Um, I think that so far we have been able we have actually I'm pleasantly surprised that we have been we have been fairly successful in terms of recovery because I think the common understanding is that hey, once a loan goes bad, it's very hard to recover, especially when we're looking at the SME space, which is considered relatively risky, right? Mm-hmm. But so far, our recovery rate has been approximately 40%, 4-0, right. while the industry standard is closer to like 25 oh, uh, wow. or so, max, right? Okay. So, and that is because we take a pretty proactive approach when it comes to to defaulted loans right so even before the loans go default usually we check in with the, with the borrowers early and we try to take a collaborative approach in terms of hey understanding why is why is the cause of, of of delays in repayments um, and try to problem solve it together with them as opposed to say hey uh, pay up or like pay, uh, or 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 be unreasonable with it, right? So that's why I think we build a lot of goodwill with SMEs that if they have a w- ability to repay, they will o- almost always repay. Mm-hmm. If if not, uh, because of the goodwill, they oftentimes have the willingness to repay. So they will gradually build up willingness to repay. Um, so, so far from a recovery perspective, we have been ex- surprisingly successful. Right, okay. Uh, next question from J. Chris Budd. How do they risk profile their borrower? So we actually have built up uh, we have a whole in-house proprietary system to actually assess borrowers, right? But I think, and we customize it based on product, based on segment, based on country. Mm-hmm. Because I think that, because SME financing is such a localized business, right? That there isn't, it's very hard to, for you to have a one-size-fits-all approach. You really need to localize, right? And because as there's, Southeast Asia is still at the early phase of digitalization, that's why we actually take a both human judgment call but as well as the data analytics approach um, side by side to actually underwrite and manage this these SMEs right I think the common misconception is that hey um, on one end you have hey we are fintech therefore we have we take we don't need any documents we take very few documents and we can with big data we can underwrite you and we can assess your risk right the truth is that dude Southeast Asia there isn't that much data for you to underwrite <laughs> um, you don't have a you ha- there, you don't have a repayment record of SMEs how are you going to use big data at an early stage right so so a lot of players who took that approach um, end up having very high defaults mm-hmm. or the other flip side of it if oftentimes startups that have started by perhaps ex-bankers and want to take a very bank-like approach right that hey this is how the banks have done it um, it must have it must you have work it, it will work kind of approach but not knowing that hey this is not going to be suitable for SMEs right so I think taking the Buddha's middle path of combining both data analytics as well as human judgment core in a very streamlined manner is, is very important I think that's why um, so far we've been able to scale well while managing defaults and uh, with the aim of, bec- of breaking even by second half next year. Right, and was this something that you guys always had like since you started? Like it was always the balance of human and like data as well? I think, th- so that has always been the case because before we, because we actually spent quite a bit of time studying the various markets in China, India, Europe and, and in US, right? Um, and we realized that this is going to, that was our entering hypothesis. Um, but over time, we also tweak and refine it along the way, right? So right. because in all, in all candor, SME financing, especially for, for bigger bigger ticket loans, it's not something that has, in a, and assess underwriting them in a in a purely tech driven manner is not a problem that has been solved in any parts of the world, right? Mm-hmm. So literally, we are playing at we are pushing the frontier of it. So anything that we can copy it overseas, we've copied, right? Um, to the extent that it makes sense in Southeast Asia, um, and then and beyond that, we just have to break new grounds, right? So we kind of take a pretty much entering hypothesis and experimental and push and gradually evolve and learn along the way. Okay, so last question from Mark J. Robbie. Uh, do you see Grab hampering the growth of funding societies in a big way? So I think this is a commonly asked question. And the truth is that I, I don't... Well, Grab is clearly entering into the finan- fi- financial services space with financing being a major, major uh, area, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Both consumer uh, and to an extent SMEs, right? Uh, but the truth is that I don't see them as 
hey, directly targeting funding societies per se. At least my my read is that given their valuation is and their skill to continuously grow, they're almost in a position that they have to just do everything. Right. Um, uh, and that, um, and we do think that the fact that they're pouring so much money in a space to, uh, it actually helps in terms of market education and expanding the pie for us. Um, and that um, it also helps, and the truth is also the SME financing is, uh, it's not a winner's take all market. Oftentimes, very few SMEs will only go to one financing company. They want to have multiple. Um, so actually, we see them as growing the pie for us as opposed to necessarily in competition. And the truth is that so far, we have not crossed fire with them as uh, uh, much in terms of actually financing SMEs, given that um, their first target market is very much SMEs within our ecosystem. Mm-hmm. They may eventually grow out of it, but um, at least our overlap so far has not been significant. Right. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, that's the episode. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining me, uh, Kelvin. Thanks for having me. Really yeah. appreciate it. So um, for our listeners, if you want to learn more about Funding Societies, you can visit its website at fundingsocieties.com uh, for those in Singapore. For you in Indonesia, it's modalku, M-O-D-A-L-K-U dot co dot id if you're in Indonesia. And for our listeners in Malaysia, it's fundingsocieties.com.my. So, yeah, until our next episode, that's the podcast. Thank you to all our listeners for listening. And thanks again, Kelvin, for sharing your thanks very inspiring for story. Me. Really appreciate it. If you like what you hear, subscribe to us wherever you're listening from. We're uploading episodes every other week. And we've got a great lineup of guests whose stories I'm very excited to share with all of you. All our episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can also find episodes on the Tech in Asia webpage at techinasia.com slash startup dash snapshot. Also, we'd very much love to hear from you, the listeners. So you can drop us an email at podcast at techinasia.com to let us know what you thought of today's episode or if you just want to drop us a message. Thanks again for tuning in to Startup Snapshot. My name is Nat. Goodbye.